it's my privilege to uh, be the current Assembly Republican leader, but what is outstanding are the quality of the people uh, within the caucus. And uh, I can tell you, after my experience both in the private sector and the public uh, sector, that there are certain people who are just outstanding legislators as well as outstanding leaders. And one of those individuals is Caroline Casagrande. Uh, she has a passion uh, for policy, but she also has a deep sensitivity with respect to making sure that women, women are treated fairly and that they have uh, equal access to employment as well as success. So it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce uh, Caroline Casagrande, who will be leading uh, some of the efforts of the caucus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leader Bramnick, for your confidence in my ability to lead our caucus on this very important issue for New Jersey. Yesterday was Mother's Day. And as the mother of two young boys, I'm very aware of what a difficult and rewarding job motherhood is. But as a full-time legislator, I know it's equally important for women to have the opportunity to continue their careers after children. Tapping into all of New Jersey's workforce, not just half of it, is what's going to really help our state's bottom line in the years to come. We start out with good news of what we know. New Jersey is already a good place for women to work. Its gender gap is the smallest in the region and one of the smallest in the country. iVillage, a popular website, recently ranked New Jersey as the 11th best state for women because of high income, high college graduation rates, health data, and low female poverty rates. Young, single, childless women here in New Jersey in both the Philadelphia, New Jersey metro area as well as the New York, New Jersey metro area out, already out-earn their male counterparts at the beginning of their careers. And when the Equal Pay Act passed in 1963, women earned 59 cents on every dollar paid to their male counterparts. That figure has increased within the United States of America to 77 cents on every dollar and here in New Jersey, we're doing just a little bit better. We're at 79 cents per dollar. New Jersey is already a good place for women to work, but we want it to be the best because when women work, New Jersey works. This summer, we're going to go around and look at some solutions on these issues. We want to make sure that women and men have an equal playing field in the workplace because a disparity means a tougher challenge for dual income families or those headed by women. We know our economy is starting to rev up again. It will never reach full speed if half the engine is idle. We know our women work just as hard as our men. They're equally talented, intelligent, and ambitious. They should be paid equally. But as you can see from two of the charts I have here today, the share of women in the workforce, where we start out as 53% of the entry level employees, and at the end of the day, we are 19% of the C-suite level employees. And you can see that as a direct pyramid that shrinks as each level of management goes up. We also know our weekly meeting earnings of full-time workers by gender and age shows a pronounced wage gap that is virtually non-existent at the beginning of a female's career, but becomes pronounced in the peak earning years of 35 through 60. That is something that we think we need to address here in New Jersey. We want salary determined by ability and experience, not gender and parental characteristics. And I say that because federal reports show that mothers earn less than women who have no children, and conversely, fathers tend to earn more than men who have no children. Starting this month, we're going to have panel discussions with New Jersey's women leaders throughout the state to focus on what we can do to close the gender gap here in New Jersey so that mothers have every opportunity to lead successful, well-paying careers. Our panelists include women leaders in business, C-level executives who've broken through the proverbial glass ceiling, academics from various New Jersey universities who are going to help us with, with data collection, as well as reports at the end of our, our series, as well as directors of statewide business associations. So far, we have three panels on the schedule. 
Wednesday, May 30th at Monmouth University, and that panel is going to feature our highest ranked woman in New Jersey government, our Lieutenant Governor Kim Granano, Tuesday, June 5th in Atlantic City, and Wednesday, June 13th in Morris County. And what we're going to do with those panels is explore a few things that we know are contributing to pyramids that look like that and graphs that show that kind of disparity. We're going to focus on things businesses can do to keep women in the workforce after they have children, such as flex hours, but we're going to take it further. We're going to look at the effect that flexible work arrangements have on promotions. We're going to talk about sometimes taboo subjects here in New Jersey business community. We're going to talk about the effect of motherhood, aka the maternal wall. And we're going to talk about women's leadership programs that have helped women who've come up through the ranks and hit that C-suite and how they did so and the types of companies that allowed them to do so. We're going to look at ways of removing bias from advancement policies and take a look at how we can change corporate cultures and general business cultures that have a tendency to create weak social bonds between male and female employees. We're going to examine companies that have had success here in New Jersey so we can replicate that success, attract more successful employers so we can figure out the best practices that grow everybody's bottom lines. And by the end of the summer, we're hopeful that we're going to know whether this is an issue that should be addressed through legislation, should be addressed through our business community, and we're going to keep this conversation going and get it louder. And we're hoping that everybody embraces these principles because we're going to make the business case that embracing these principles is going to save New Jersey companies money long term. We're going to talk about the cost of attrition. We're going to talk about the cost of a workforce dropout. We're going to talk about when you're able to keep an experienced employee on those salary rolls, what that experience does for the efficiency of your company. We're going to make the business case to New Jersey companies that having women-friendly policies is what's going to grow their bottom line here in New Jersey. We're going to do it in a state that has become a much better place for working women because we firmly believe that when women work, New Jersey works. Thank you. And I'll be happy to take any questions. What do you think of uh, Pamela Lampett's uh, bills? Well, some of Pamela Lampett's bills I was able to support. Um, but I think that a lot of that legislation having to do with signage in the workforce or duplicative of, of federal lawsuits that can already be brought really, I think, are duplicative of existing laws. And I don't know, I'm hopeful they're going to do something, but I don't know in terms of real world experience whether they're going to be able to increase women's pay or opportunities for advancement. I don't know if mirroring, mirroring lawsuits that can be brought on the federal level to the state level is going to change that, that pyramid, of, uh, you know, in, in terms of the fact that we start out with 53% of the entry level and end up at 19% of, of of the top of our companies. Um, so it's a good start, but I don't think we've gone far enough, and I don't think it's the kind of cultural change we're going to need to change numbers like that. So is your, uh, your thoughts based more on establishing a work-life balance for women and men? But even though you're still going to work on, on, on the theory of your legislation, you know, what ways do you think the state might help companies or require companies to, to work on that? Well, we're going to look at work-life balance, and we've talked a little bit about that in New Jersey with paid family leave and so forth. Mm -hmm. But what you find underneath work-life balance, because we've, we've had that in place for about three years now, right, and these numbers aren't shifting, what we find is there's actually a discrimination that comes from workers and employees that tend to take the opportunity for those flex hours. And so we're going to talk about it even further in terms of, yes, you can have you can have work-life balance. You can have those flex programs. Now, how are we treating people who take those flex programs? Are we pulling them along for advancement the same as everybody else? Or is there a latent discrimination that's taking place? And if we need legislation to correct that, we're going to introduce it. But we're going to really spend a lot of time talking about the underneath of these reasons. And we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about whether we need legislation or whether we as leaders of this state just need to start talking about this and really making the business case that making these companies more efficient, 
by retaining these valued employees is going to absolutely make New Jersey a better place to work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.